What I'm going to do is to give a, a slightly more detailed picture of the religious landscape in, in South Asia, in particular in India, uh, as a response to what both Charles and Jose have said. And I'd like to do this uh, by drawing you into, um, I mean, to give a, an idea of, of, of uh, the traditions that exist in South Asia, uh, particularly in India, I'd like, you, I'd like to do this by drawing, your, drawing you into a, a kind of a thought experiment, a, a very s silly uh, speculative history uh, over a long period of time. So uh, let's imagine that uh, sometime, you know, in the very distant past, uh, human beings developed the capacity for transcendence, uh, which is to say they, they were able to holistically examine the whole world, uh, their life, uh, their selves, uh, and, and to see what uh, uh, limitations there were in, in all these things, and they also developed an aspiration to overcome those limitations. So, so uh, they saw that there was a wide gap that was opening up between what they currently were and what they as could become at their best, uh, what the world could become at its, at its best. And uh, uh, so they, 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 they want, they sort of develop uh, this need to, to have new forms of of uh, self-cultivation, self-formation, self-realization, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and let's say that these were, uh, I mean, if we were a little more pessimistic, uh, there were ways of saving ourselves in the world, particularly in the face of, of death. <coughs> now, uh, it's doubtful that it was ever possible to get on to this whole process of self-formation, self-cultivation without some teachings, uh, without the brilliance or the, without the insight and wisdom of some, some teacher who we could look up to, uh, whether it was the teacher was dead or alive, uh, who had deep influence on us and who could be an exemplar uh, for, our, for our life. And let's say that uh, uh, once we start to take this step, let's, let's call this step number two, uh, this idea that we have to get on to this journey and the journey, we can launch ourselves into this journey only when we have a teacher uh, who we can follow and who can be an exemplar. And let's see that there were other such people who were with us, who also joined in the same journey. And we recognized that these were co-travelers on that journey. So we developed a certain sense of commonality, a, a certain sense of solidarity with one another. And that was absolutely important for mutual learning, for mutual re reinforcement, for for, uh, for, for, for uh, collective self-discipline, all these things were important. So let's say this is the third uh, major step that we take. And now, all these, these, these this, this whole complex, uh, let's, you know, for some people, particularly in India, this was sufficient to be called, you know, what we now understand as religion. It's, it's, it's a path, it's a way, it's what they call marga, uh, uh, on, on, which you, uh, you, which, which you, on which you launch yourself. Uh, the idea here, as you can tell, is, is that you have to both rise above and to dig beneath. Uh, it's... it's uh, the, the whole point of doing this is to somehow lift yourself and to gain something higher and to gain something deeper. And, and, and this is the idea uh, which was 
very, very important in South Asian traditions. Uh, take, for example, Buddha or Mahavira, uh, the Jaina tradition or the Buddhist tradition. Uh, these are all uh, sort of premised on something like, something like what I've just said. But of course, this is not true only of South Asia. It's also true, for example, of early Christianity. I'm thinking of uh, uh, St. Augustine, who, who, wrote this, uh, who wrote this book called On the True Religion. Uh, and uh, uh, if we read it today, people will start thinking that he's talking about Christianity because he'd converted to Christianity. But that's not the case. What he was trying to develop, and here I rely on, 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 on another <laughs> A Canadian who I deeply admire, like Charles uh, Wilfred, Catwell, Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Uh, uh, for Augustine, uh, this was the, 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 the true religion, but actually uh, the best form of, of proper piety. Uh, how do we develop an ideal and perfect relationship with God, who is the supreme good. It's that bond that you establish between yourself and, and God, that tie, uh, that attachment. That's what he was really talking about. He was not talking about Christianity. And you see the same thing repeated a thousand years later when you look at another Renaissance thinker, Ficino, who again uh, wrote a book called The Christian Religion. And again, we were we might imagine that he's really talking about Christianity, but he wasn't talking about Christianity uh, in the sense in which we understand Christianity today, because what Christian meant at that time was not anything that pertains to Christianity, but that which pertains to Christ. So religio for him, uh, for Ficino, was, was a, a, an instinct that all humans have. It's an instinct that is given to them by the divine, it's all humans have uh, to undertake this journey. And Christian religion was a journey which is undertaken with Christ, with Christ's teachings, and with, the, with Christ as an exemplar. So there was another, this is a particularly uh, 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 kind of supremely good strategy uh, uh, of self-formation to get into this journey, to, to reach the ultimate good, which is God, by the example, truth, by following the example of Christ. So you can see that teachings, the teacher, an exemplar, self-cultivation, this is really what uh, religion meant in, in South Asian traditions, and I believe in, in uh, early Christian traditions as well. Uh, now, uh, in South Asia, of course, along with all this, uh, there was something else. You could not just move up and dig beneath, but you could move sideways. Uh, Jose mentioned this religious pluralism. And that is one of the remarkable things about South Asia, which is that people could, there was always in the intellectual, philosophical, religious, social landscape, many, many different soteriologies uh, or ethical, political, uh, or ethical moral perspectives. Uh, and people could choose from any one of them. And not only that, people could move over a lifetime from one to the other quite freely. And sometimes they could inhabit all of them at once. There could be multiple attachments. Attachment is the right term here. And, uh, you know, in the South Asian tradition, you're attached to teachings. You're attached to, 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 uh, to uh, your, your guru or your, or your teacher. Uh, there is no sense of belonging. You know, belonging is, is an idea that uh, has different connotations. Uh, I mean, at least in some, sometimes it has different connotations. It sort of, it's, you, you, you are a member of a group or you, you're, you're a property of something you, 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 uh, you're owned by something. It has that, those kind of senses, not in the sense in which we sometimes use belonging, uh, which is very similar to attachment, but, but very often that is a sense, you know, membership of an order, membership of a group, but that is not there in, in the South Asian tradition. 
The idea of attachment is much more uh, prevalent. And, and you could have multiple attachments very easily, move from one to the other, be in all, and sometimes fashion your own. That's what Buddha did, after all. Fashion his own uh, soteriology. You don't have to, uh, you could become a teacher yourself. So, so all these possibilities were always there in ancient South Indian, South Asian traditions, and, and this is what we might call religion in South Asia. Or let's say, let's, let's call it a, a one aspect of religion, because there were other aspects of religion which also developed, and that were developed by taking, you know, step, over a period of time, you can say step five, step six, six, seven, eight, and so on. And what are these steps? Well, first of all, the whole, entire community develops a certain institutionalized structure, and very often this structure has uh, status hierarchies and power hierarchies, hierarchies of, of knowledge, those who know and those who do not know, and, and this hierarchical institutionalized structure becomes completely interwoven with a, a community so that the community itself is defined by, by the structure. Not only that, there are some people who claim to know teachings better, they develop a systematic intellectual doctrine. So now, uh, a religion is defined both by a doctrine and by this, by this institutionalized, powerful institutionalized structure. And these, so religion is no longer, you know, what I just said was part of the South Asian tradition. All of this is also part of religion. Uh, and this, again, takes place both in Asia, South Asia, and in, and in the Western Christian world. In the Western Christian world, I think, although I don't know much about this, the church plays a pretty important role. And in India, it's the caste system, the caste order, which plays a very important role. And two other developments that take place along with it, which are the development of what we might call modern religion. One is that there are some people who become gatekeepers, people who decide, you know, that there are certain rules that have developed, and people who decide who is going to enter, who is going to exit, which rules have to be followed, uh, and if people fail, then they become betrayers. And if, uh, uh, if, 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 you ha if you abide by them very strictly, then you are part of something you're doing. Uh, you, you are uh, that religious. You're a member of that group. Otherwise, you're not, and so on. And the other, and that happens in, in, in India as well. It's the Bram Brahmins in the caste system who, provide, who play precisely this role of gatekeepers. But there are also some differences. The differences are that in Western, Christian, as, uh, Western Christianity, as Charles pointed out, the entire thing becomes one package or one bundle. The soteriology, the whole powerful bureaucratic institutionalized structure, all the rituals, the rites, the uh, rites of passages, uh, rules of hygiene, this is all one package. All of this is called religion. In India, on the other hand, something different happens, which is that the, the two, this, your, your ethical uh, moral worldview, your soteriology, that remains separate. And this entire world of caste relations, the normative expectations that you have from one another, the rules of hygiene, they are separate, so the, they, don't for, they don't come together to form one system, their connection between them remains very loose. So while the caste system becomes very rigid and there is very little freedom, and you could say that you can belong to this caste but not to that caste, belonging is the right term to use here, when it comes to the, the ethical political perspectives or all the soteriologies, the freedom is still there. You could move from one to the other. You could be, you could be part of the, you know, one caste, but you could be a Buddhist at one time, and you may become a Jain at some other time. You could remain part of the Vedic Brahminical system and also become a little bit of a Buddhist, so Brahmins could become Buddhists and so on. So this kind of freedom is still very much there, unlike in the West. And finally, there's the last step which is taken, which is, I, call it step number eight, which is 
a step that is taken in the West in the 15th, 15th century, 16th century, uh, particularly in the, in the wars of Europe, which is that these groups have demarcated very rigid boundaries. There are categorical identities. Uh, you're, you're either this or you're that. And there are people who are fighting for the allegiance of individuals. Uh, Jose used the word confessionalization, which is again pretty much uh, correct here. And uh, these, are, these, be, these groups are seeing each other as rivals. They're competing with each other. They're, they're defining themselves in opposition to each other. Uh, uh, and and uh, they're fighting. And indeed, they're even prepared to break their heads over minor differences of, in doctrine or in practice, and so on. And, and uh, I'm afraid this step, which was taken in the West in the 16th century, that step was taken in India in the late 19th and early 20th century. And, and if you know, if you're talking about modern religion, you cannot, you have to think of all these eight steps. And then you get something like what we understand as modern religion. Uh, in India, these steps have been taken, and we've reached that last stage as well in the 20th century. So now, and we have what we call it communalism, and it's very much linked to nationalism, right? Okay, so I've described as briefly as I could this broad sort of historical landscape, and now very uh, even more briefly, let me just talk about some contemporary developments. In the West, this has been very well described by both Charles and, and, and Jose, there has been this un, what they call unbundling. You know, the, so the church is weakened. Uh, doc, there are no longer people uh, believing in the doctrine. And yet, uh, uh, there are new, without the control of the clerics, people are still longing for some relationship to the higher, to higher power, or heart to supreme good, some form of spiritualism. This is the, uh, these are, and, and this is a wide variety of paths by which you can do it, so immense religious pluralism. Uh, there is one development taking place in, in the West, which corresponds to, to something like what I just said. In India, on the other hand, we are probably going in the reverse direction. Uh, instead of, there is on, the one hand, I'll talk, uh, th there is a lot of religious pluralism. Uh, there are new religious movements, very much like Brazil, where uh, all kinds of uh, gurus uh, are, are sprouting uh, with their teachings uh, and uh, new forms of spirituality. There is a lot of emphasis, these are modern religions, so a lot of emphasis on individual freedom, individual belief. The internal structure is pretty egalitarian. There is a lot of emphasis on, on, on physical and mental well-being, on happiness, and so on. So these are new religion movements, and they are everywhere. And they're far more open. They, they replicate some of the things of the ancient traditions because they're open to, to not only men and women, but also to Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs. You know, all of them come together in these new uh, tiny religious formations following a certain guru. Shirdi Baba, and all so on. But at the same time, these, what has happened, particularly uh, after nationalism, uh, what has happened, uh, the birth of the linkage between modern religion with its categorical identity, something that occurs in the 19th century and the late, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and with the, the fuel that it got from a certain kind of ethno-nationalism what you've got is uh, modern communal rivalry, modern communal conflict, and modern communal massacres, and sometimes even genocide. Uh, so, so on the one hand, we see a trend developing which begins to resemble uh, terribly like what happened in Europe in the 16th century. And on the other hand, there is a resistance to this trend which is coming from these little, little uh, groups uh, the, who are either claiming to be you know, gurus who are claiming to be gods uh, with, uh, with uh, sort of all kinds of, they're, they're, they're not non-Brahminical, new, you know, they, they get all kinds of 
uh, mem members of all castes get into these religious formations, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, not Christian, I'm afraid, but they all get into, into these. Uh, and, and so we have a very interesting but, uh, but very contradictory developments in India. Yeah, thanks.